o te moa i whaatalo whaatur pa ia maolunga leo fia. Mālo le soi fua maua ma le lange mama. Welcome to our uh, Facebook Live. Um, just to recognise the Kingdom of Tonga and the Tongan language week that we enjoyed. Mālo e le le. And uh, on the way here to the Ministry of Health, I picked up uh, one of the tokos, or uh, as you would know, one of the brothers. Or as Samoans would say, one of the uso, so toko uso. So one of my toko usos that I want to introduce, I think you're familiar with him, my brother, Dr. Ashley Bloomfield. Thanks, Lalu. Uh, good to see you. Welcome to the Ministry of Health. Great to be on this Facebook Live session today. Malo lele to uh, our Tongan uh, folk. And as we finish off the celebration of Tongan Language Week, we're starting to wiki o te reo Māori. So kia ora koutou katoa. Welcome everybody to this session. Looking forward to the chat today. Yeah, I just want to give a special acknowledgement to Tangata Pacifica, Pacific Media Network, and all of those that are streaming us live. It's been an amazing, uh, crazy season for our Pacific communities. And I just want to acknowledge kind of in, in terms of reflections, just uh, how our churches have responded um, with real pace and speed. Um, acknowledge uh, Maji Upper, our chief executive there at Counties Manukau, who with myself were able to do daily stand-ups with our churches, and then the churches were able to keep our community safe. So um, it's been really great to, to, just to see how our churches have responded um, in, in this season of crisis. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that, Lolo. And a big shout out to you and your team. And you've talked about Fupuli Ai Maji Upper, uh, the chief executive at Counties Manukau District Health Board, and actually my former boss. So she taught me much of what I know as we joke about. But no, seriously, Margie's just been fantastic and her team um, have worked so closely with the Pacifica community in Auckland. Um, and you know, we were discussing earlier on, uh, Lulu, about the, the strength in our churches, uh, uh, the Pacific churches, and that's really shone through in the response to this outbreak up in Auckland where our Pacifica community has been hit and some of those infections have happened in the church communities, but the ability of the leaders in those communities and the wider Pacific leaders to actually work with the health system and work with other government agencies to rapidly reach out to the wider um, uh, whānau that are part of those congregations and really quickly get them, uh, get the contact tracing done and the testing done has just been a huge strength and something we should celebrate from this um, from this latest outbreak. So I just want to absolutely uh, um, support and thank the, the Pacific uh, church communities and the wider Pacific community uh, in Auckland for the work they have put in, for the support they have given our efforts and for they, the way they have worked in partnership with our health and other social providers. I know that when, when the, um, the second wave in particular um, started, I know that some of our churches were really um, uh, really concerned and that's why we had those daily stand-ups but what we found is that as we went through the process of just engaging and uh, making information really clear what does contact tracing mean what does testing mean um, how do you social distance or physical distance all those types of issues we, by the end of the second week there was just real clarity mm -hmm. and we're hoping that as we go through the conversations hear some questions or read some questions we'll be able to respond and provide even more clarity, probably more clarity from you than from someone like, like myself, I think. Well, you know, one of the things about this, um, this whole challenge uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic is we're all learning. We're all learning every day and we know so much more now than we knew back in January when this disease first um, came onto our radar. And the reason we've done so well as a country is that we have been prepared to look and see what's happening both in New Zealand as well as around the globe, look at the evidence, look at the experience of other countries and then decide which pathway we wanted to take. And the reason we've been successful is because all of New Zealand has gotten behind that effort and we have worked really hard to help people understand the why of what we're doing. And so today's session is a little bit about trying to um, to grow on to grow that and to expand on that. So, you know, we've got some questions to start with which are, are about um, the fact that we've had clusters in, in our churches here, some of our infections in churches here in New Zealand and overseas. And so we've seen transmission within churches and some questions about what else can be done within the church context and within the church congregation to help protect uh, members and also prevent um, the spread of COVID-19. Well, I guess there are some features of, of the church community that mean that COVID-19 
can spread within within churches. You know, the reason, of course, we get together on a Sunday at church is, to, is for fellowship, it's to commune, and so that involves a lot of interaction, physical interaction. We share the peace in some of the more, um, you know, in the Anglican church, and, and, and we do tend to, to hug and we tend to kiss, and also, of course, a lot of singing, and I know that's a big thing for Pacific churches. And we also know from, from studies around the world that, ch uh, that singing is one way this virus can, um, can spread. But the measures that, that uh, we can use in the church community are the same as in any um, setting, really, in any gathering. And that is, and the, the single most important thing is, if you're not well, don't go to church. And also don't go to work and don't go to school. That's the single most important thing we can do to protect each other. And then, of course, there's other things like hand hygiene, if appropriate, use of masks, but also that physical distancing where possible. And of course, good cleaning uh, to help uh, get rid of any infections, whether it's COVID-19 or other infectious um, bacteria or viruses. I know one of the questions that the churches will be asking, and, and I, I was asked this question too, was that we can gather at a sports arena, or we can gather at a, um, like maybe at the, going to the mall or even going to a, a movie, you know, go watch a movie, yet we can't gather as a, as a church. Um, do, do you have any other responses to that, please, Ashley? Just yeah, to I, I can understand that's a real, that is a real, um, it seems to be like this, uh, that, that there's two different things playing out here or two different standards. And I guess part of our thinking on this is, and it's not just churches, it's those really important um, ceremonies as well, like funerals, like weddings, like big birthday parties and, and other important life events. And that is because when we're with people we know, we tend to not maintain that physical distancing. Whereas in some of those other settings, for example, even at a restaurant or a, or a bar, with that group of 10, we can stay in those groups and then there are other things to maintain the physical distancing. And what we've seen here in New Zealand, as well as overseas, is that most of those infections um, that are transmitted from a case to someone else occur in the settings where people are close particularly in the family home, but also in churches um, at events like weddings or funerals. And so that's why we've thought about those sorts of activities a little bit differently. And just as you mentioned funerals, I just want to acknowledge um, one of our um, um, martyrs from the Pacific community, in particular the Kokan community, Dr. Joe Williams, mm. um, sorely missed. A great man um, in, in the health sector also, so we want to just acknowledge uh, uh, Dr. Joe Williams. You've talked about uh, different things and the importance of um, trace, contact tracing and all that. Using the app too is really important, but I think the other big thing is the use of uh, masks hey, is really important. I just want to acknowledge um, my wife who uh, created this amazing mask uh, for me. So I think, you, I think maybe I get you to introduce to show how we do it, and then me as a rookie can then you know, try it after you. Is that all right? Sounds good, and I've, uh, this is a bit easier. I, I gave a demonstration on putting a mask on, uh, impromptu on, uh, on uh, national television, and uh, there's always a bit of a risk there because you've got to do it right to prevent uh, <laughs> infection. I've got one of the, the uh, disposable masks, and actually we've distributed about five million of these from our, our, our quite large health system stocks that we've got at the moment around the community. You might see that it will have these available in the community. So this is one, th these are really good ones. They just go around your ears. So the important thing is grab the ear loops and then you put it up and around the ears and then on the outside, you wanna grab it and pull it down like that. Oops, come off that ear. And then this one has, is quite good because it's got a little wire here, which you can mold to the top of your nose. And what that does help with people like me and you who wear glasses it, can, it helps you stop your glasses fogging up, although I can feel mine fogging up a bit. So that's the correct technique. Grab the loops over the ears and then mould it to the top if you've got a little I, wire. I don't need a wire because I've got a flat nose, so it's just nice and easy. Anyway, so what? grab the loops like this. See, like, look how my wife created this and then... Put Very it nice shape just. on that one, Lola. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Made to measure. Made to measure. It takes into account the flatness of my nose and no... Um, and a pretty stunning look there too, mate. I think so. Yeah. It's a good look for me. But yeah, this is how we do it, people. It's going to be like this for a little bit longer, uh, also. Yeah, and, and what uh, we've done with masks is uh, the, the World Health Organization has been constantly looking at the evidence around masks, as have we. And we've uh, seen the, that they 
particularly where you've got community transmission, which we have had in Auckland and Tamaki Makaurau um, over the last few weeks, they do play a role. And so the government has um, required them to be used in public transport and on aircraft. Uh, and we're doing that right around the country. And I think it's been great to see New Zealanders lean into this and actually use masks in these settings. And because of that, then we can start to think about how we might be able to reduce physical distancing in those settings. But in addition to public transport, there will be other places where it will make sense to use a mask where you can't necessarily physically distance. So if you're going out to a place like the supermarket where you might be um, uh, coming into or passing by people you don't know and you can't keep that one to two metre distance, can be really helpful to use a mask there. And I think one of the things as Kiwis we're going to have to get used to is seeing and using masks more regularly around the place. It's, it's, I just note some of the questions here. Um, we've got one from Domains, I think that's how you pronounce it. So if I'm getting your name wrong. Uh, how can we better encourage mask use in the general public for indoor settings, especially in confined spaces when social distancing is not possible? Yeah, and uh, at the moment we, we, they're only mandated on, the, on that public transport and flights. Uh, but part of it is also I think we're going to have to get used to it. Even when we come down out of Alert Level 2, continuing to use masks in those settings and possibly in other ones as well. So um, the, the key thing here is in confined spaces where social distancing is not possible, absolutely encourage you to, keep, to use a mask and use it properly. And I think that, um, that goes into a, a live question we've got from Gayatri, which is why not mandate masks in schools and in school buses and in workplaces? Well, one of the things about schools and school buses, it, and at the moment, um, uh, children over 12 or teenagers are required to use them on the school buses and on public transport. It's just the, the WH evidence suggests that under 12, the, the risk associated with mask use, because children are less likely to be able to use them um, uh, safely, the risk may be more of infection than of lowering the, 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 the possibility of infection. But so saying, some, some children or many children under 12 may be able to use a mask safely and that's fine to use them. The key thing is of course in schools, uh, in classrooms and in workplaces we know the people we are with and so if we do get a case in a workplace or a school and in, in the last couple of weeks we've had some schools where there has been a case it's very easy for us to quickly identify not just who is at the school, but then to reach out to them and if necessary, test them and isolate them. It's where you may be encountering people like on a flight or on public transport that you don't know. And so that's where masks are of real value. But of course, even when you're using a mask, uh, still try and maintain that physical distancing. And does, what about those that can't wear masks there might be a medical condition or something what, what do you say to that because I can imagine you know in this heightened sensitivity by our community someone might look at someone that should be wearing a mask as not wearing a mask thinking you know what's up with that so yeah, yeah. I think two things there Laulu the first is of course we've been talking about masks but actually the 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 requirement uh, on public transport or on a flight is a face covering now that could be a bandana, it could be a scarf, and you'll see some people out, especially in winter, we're using a scarf, uh, and that can be uh, can have uh, some effect as well. So some people who can't use a mask in itself will still be able to use some form of face covering. But if you do see someone who's not using a mask, yeah, it's important not to assume that they're just disobeying the rules. Actually, some people can't use a mask for a range of reasons. So. Um, it, you know, uh, just to encourage them to and, and think about how you can maintain physical distancing from those people. I like that you said that we don't have to always have a mask. I just want to shout out um, Reverend Sitaita uh, Vekune who uses like a scarf, looks like a ninja, um, but she uses a scarf which is really good and you'll see that in a video. Uh, we got your back out to raw video. Anyway, some, something you can look into. Another question here from Jenna, what steps are being taken to develop a pandemic plan for future use in New Zealand against the next disease outbreak, Doctor? Yeah, well, that's a, thanks, Salo and, and Jenna, that's a really good question. And I should say that coming into this pandemic, we had a very um, uh, thorough, uh, well-developed pandemic plan. It was actually an influenza pandemic plan. And one of the things that was interesting was uh, we got a little bit into the plan and into the pandemic and then realised, actually, we've got to change tack a bit here because the, phase, the first two phases were around keep it out and then stamp it out. 
And then the next phase was to go to manage it. And we made an explicit decision because we saw what was happening in other countries that were trying to manage it. And actually we couldn't manage it. They couldn't manage it. So we made that decision to stay with this, keep it out, stamp it out approach. And so one of the big learnings for us, one of the big lessons over the last few months is it's good to have done some planning, but rather than do a whole lot of detailed planning, what we need to do is, is make sure we've got a lot of people and we've got a really clear high level plan and that we're able to shift and change tack or pivot our response uh, as quickly as possible if we need to and constantly learning. So we are looking to revise our current plan and, uh, and we're constantly looking to re uh, revise and improve our response to this pandemic, but also to think, what are the lessons for our future responses? I think that's one of the things I loved about how we've engaged with our churches, mm -hmm. is that how they've come out with you know, various plans to look after their communities, which has been really good, and has shown how positive it has been when we actually give real clear um, access to information. Um, the other thing that we've got here is that, you know, we're connected to our Pacific communities in the Pacific. You know, I, I dread the day that, you know, somehow we, it gets into the Pacific. What kind of planning is there done to make sure that our Pacific communities in the Pacific are not being impacted? Yeah, look, uh, look thanks so much for that question. And a couple of comments here. here. First of all, as you say, uh, Laulu, we, we also were absolutely clear we didn't want to be um, the pathway for this um, virus getting into the Pacific. It's a very tricky virus. We've found that in New Zealand. And so one of our key motivators, one of our key reasons why we went um, with the response we did early on was because we wanted to prevent it, not just um, having a huge impact in Aotearoa New Zealand, but also in our Pacific neighbours, realm countries, and, and in particularly across um, the uh, Polynesia. So we've worked right from the start really closely with those countries to make sure there wasn't a route for this virus through New Zealand into the Pacific. And secondly, we continue to work closely with them and part of that is our, engage, our ongoing engagement with you, our foreign affairs colleagues who we're working really closely with to make sure not only are we preventing the virus getting to the Pacific, but we're supporting their response as well. And one of the, for example, one of the key things we're looking at now is as we look to the development of vaccines around the globe, is not just thinking about what's our responsibility to New Zealanders, but what's our responsibility for the wider Pacific as well to make sure that they don't miss out. Ashley, how do we um, encourage our community? You know, uh, I was recently up in Auckland and uh, even just as you talk to friends and family, there's just this real sense of fatigue. You know, another wave. What happens when there's another wave? Or well, what happens if there's something else? Like, how can we encourage not just our, the community, but even our children that are mm -hmm. maybe watching this too? How, you know, what, what's your message of hope for us to just keep pushing through and not giving up? Well, I think you, you've, uh, you've um, struck on exactly the right word there, Laulu. It's about hope, isn't it? Because if we don't have hope, then, uh, then we feel even, even more, you know, there's nothing like being hopeless or not having hope. There is great hope um, that we can and should hold on to. First of all, our response in this country has been fantastic. And the reason it's been fantastic is because all New Zealanders have gotten behind it. So it's one thing for our health system to provide leadership and the all of government, uh, public sector to provide leadership and our politicians to provide leadership. But that only goes so far if New Zealanders don't get in behind it. And so we can be very hopeful about our response to date. We've chosen our pathway and we've been successful on that to date. And other people around the globe are looking to us as a beacon of hope. The second thing here is, look, we are in this for a medium to long term haul and we need to be prepared for that. We've done the, the initial response, the, the sprint, and now we've got to just make sure we are preparing for and building our reserves so we can maintain that response. I know people are fatigued and tired. We are here at the ministry and there are many people across the public sector who've been working really hard on the response. So we've got to think about what do we need to do to make sure we've got the physical and the mental and the emotional and the spiritual reserves to carry ourselves through this and to look after our children as well. So I think making sure we are being hopeful, that we are pacing ourselves, that we're tuning into how we're feeling, how's our mental well-being. And I've talked about how, you know, after many months of doing this and doing the, you know, my stand-ups 
I found that quite stressful and, and I could feel that I would, was getting anxious before them. And to me, what that was, was a signal I needed to take some downtime, spend some time with family. And it was just great. And then I was much better off. I was refreshed and ready to come back in and, and make, good, make good decisions and give good advice. So we've got to stay, look out for each, look, we've got to look out for each other and stay tuned into how we are feeling. I remember you um, were scoring a try, you know, in that rugby game that you went on. Did that, that help with your mental health, do you think? Well, it's the first game I've played in 35 <laughs> years. And even though that try was a real gimme, uh, I got past the ball over the line. Uh, it certainly, uh, you know, was a good feeling. So, yeah, I think just that whole, what, what, what I loved about that occasion was the whole community coming out. And it was actually a time of, of, of community, a time of celebration. And, you know, uh, to play alongside some of these um, these great Pacific players like Rodney Saiolo and uh, uh, Faifili Lavave uh, was just uh, and you know wonderful people and uh, I, I'll never be I never thought I'd be lifted in a line out by those two guys. Great Samoan rugby players, I might add. Hey, indeed, no, great, indeed. great, great. Peter, thank you for your question. I, I see here, I'm actually getting angry. Uh, look for from some people when I'm wearing a mask in public, like they think I'm sick. Is there a plan to improve the education about mm. this? Yeah, look, that's a really good comment, Peter. And, um, you know, a couple of things there. One is, it's again about normalising the use of masks. And the, and the more people use them, the less people will look sideways at people who are using them. The other thing, uh, you know, interestingly, one of the things that I've found quite compelling around the evidence in masks is they did a study in northern Italy in Milan, which was one of the first uh, affected cities in Europe around the, um, the outbreak there. And they found that when people were wearing masks, um, there, was more di they, there was more likely to be physical distance between them and other people. And they think there are two reasons for that. First of all, people do give them a wide berth because they think they might be infectious. But also the mask is a constant reminder that actually we, we are in a situation here where we're trying to behave differently, where we're trying to keep physical distancing. And, and so masks are a really good reminder. And again, if I look on public transport and of course on flights, everybody is wearing a mask now, they have to. And we just need to start carrying that over into other settings and setting an example. Maybe you and I need to do a bit more of that, Laulu. I think um, as we become more familiar as a community around the use of masks, I know that um, my first flight up to Auckland over the weekend, it was a bit weird seeing others wearing the masks. And it, but I, I found it, Peter, it was actually the other way around. It was when I didn't see someone wearing a mask, there was more like, hey, why aren't you wearing one? It was more that way inclined. I know that um, there's a lot of um, rumour mill things happening, conspiracy the uh, theory things happening. I know it's been big in our Pacific communities. That's why uh, with our COVID-19 response, we did the We Got Your Back Out to Raw hashtag, We Got Your Back Out to Raw. Jump on our MPP website, our MPP Facebook page, Instagram, LinkedIn, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But we had videos which was just trying to um, uh, let our communities know this is really real. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk to, you know, uh, misinformation and disinformation, please? Yeah, look, I'd love to, Lolo. And uh, we've got some questions from Pamela and Catherine and others about this. And one of the points they make is, and they say there are numerous doctors and epidemiologists now saying this virus is no different to the usual flu. In fact, that's not correct in two ways. First of all, the vast majority of doctors and epidemiologists and senior health leaders around the globe, from the Director General of the World Health Organization uh, down, um, are not saying this. The, the vast majority of specialists in this area acknowledge that we have a really serious issue with this pandemic. It is the biggest global challenge. It has been described as the biggest global challenge since World War II. And there's no doubt in my mind that's correct. This is not just another virus. It's, we've already seen it's about 10 times more deadly than the, the influenza virus that, we, that circulates in the community every year. And even in a country like ours, New Zealand, where we've gone so hard to try and um, stop this infection um, spreading in our communities. We have had deaths, we've had 24, and you mentioned uh, Dr. Joe Williams, unfortunately, as one of those recently, and someone I had met and greatly admired and enjoyed uh, spending time with. So this is a serious um, infection. And just by way of comparison, if people think that because we've only had 24 deaths, that's not so many. If we were the United Kingdom, on the same, if, and we, our population base, if you look at our population base now, uh, if we had followed the route that, that Britain uh, had followed, 
we would have had three and a half thousand deaths from COVID-19 by now. And just to put that in context, in New Zealand in any one year, there is only about 25,000 deaths. So that would have been a significant impact. And not only that, and this is an important point, 20% of those deaths would have been amongst healthcare workers. So um, we have not only prevented uh, death and, um, and disease in our population, we have protected our healthcare system and our healthcare workforce so they can continue to provide the full range of care that New Zealanders need. And we also firmly believe that still that this was the best thing for our economy, even though we've certainly taken a big economic hit and many families will be finding that a real challenge. Um, we know that countries that haven't followed the route New Zealand has have had an even bigger economic um, hit. Yeah, and just um, on behalf of the churches and our Pacific community, if it's not from COVID-19 or the information is not being disseminated from the Ministry of Health or from MPP, then please really check and refrain from sharing that information. Well, yeah, I think we're coming to the end of the time, Lowell. It's been fantastic to be able to um, be part of this. I want to thank everyone for tuning in, uh, for your words of support, and and just to say that um, even though it's a long haul, this and and I talked about being fatigued. You know, every day I come to work and I get emails and letters and messages of gratitude from ordinary New Zealanders, and they're th they're to me and through me, but they are to the wider team in the Ministry of Health and and across government. And I think people recognise the hard work that's going on across government to keep New Zealanders safe and to protect them from this major challenge. So thanks so much for tuning in. We will be saving this video so you can, uh, if you really want to, come back and have another viewing or refer it to your friends. Uh, so kia ora koutou katoa. Yeah, and thank you family for joining us on uh, our Facebook Live. I a whakmanwea maile tu tato maftanga faftai suifua ma i manwea.